Pulteney Town sits on the south side of the Wick River. The new town and the harbour were planned by engineer Thomas Telford around 1805 on behalf of the British Fisheries Society and Pulteney Town was named after Telford's patron, Sir William Pulteney. George Byrne was the contractor for both the harbour and the bridge. Pulteney Town was a planned industrial fishing port designed to accommodate the expanding herring fishing industry. Telford took care in his plans to give people good housing and working conditions. Throughout the 19th century, the fishing industry expanded and Wick became the herring capital of Europe. The planned village was built upon land obtained from Sir Benjamin de Barr of Hempriggs and laid out on a grid system accommodating houses and yards for the fishermen and their families in Lower Pulteney Town, close to the harbour. Many of the streets in the area were named after directors of the British Fisheries Society. Pulteney Town itself was named after Lord William Pulteney, Governor of the British Fisheries Society. Upper Pulteney Town was also laid out in a grid system, with Argyle Square in the heart of the residential area. Most dwellings in Pulteney Town open onto the street as it was feared that front gardens would be used as middens. The roundhouse in its commanding position over the inner harbour was built by George Byrne, the contractor responsible for constructing the Wick Bridge, the inner harbour and many houses in Pulteney. Thomas Telford drew the plans, originally as a speculative scheme to lease the building as an inn. Once built, however, Byrne made the building his own house as many independent inns and dram shops had sprung up in the area. Later, the house was occupied by James Bremner and his family. When the house proved too small for the family, James had the ingenious idea of raising the roof by means of powerful jacks, allowing a second storey to be built. James Bremner was a boat builder, harbour builder and wreck raiser, and his house was often used by shipwrecked sailors recovering from their ordeals. In 1881, the Fog Cannon was presented to the Pulteney Harbour Trust by John Pender MP for the use of the fishermen and vessels visiting the coast. The gun was deemed necessary due to the loss of many fishermen in tragic events at sea. Sir John Pender was born in Bonhill, Western Bortonshire. He represented Wick and Pulteney boroughs as MP from 1872 to 1885 and 1892 to 1896. In 1864 he formed the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company, Telcom, and the following year he confounded the Anglo-American Telegraph Company to lay the new Atlantic Cable. In 1869 his British Indian Submarine Telegraph Company laid an undersea cable to India. Wick Harbour's got a long, long history of different industries. It's been a fishing port for centuries. It followed Staxco when Staxco got busy with the turn to Wick. However, in 1803, Telford uh, started work and uh, created the Pulteney Town and the first industrial estate in the world um, down at the uh, Lower Pulteney. However, you know, as was found, the harbour still didn't offer adequate shelter for the ever increasing numbers uh, of vessels coming in to either uh, fish or export the fish to uh, Russia and Europe. And uh, the British Fisheries Society set about improving that uh, situation and in 1818 uh, there was about 822 boats uh, based in the harbour. And with that of course came the need for extra pubs and bars and dram shops and the population continued to grow. During that period uh, the fishing fleet was mainly um, scaffies, uh, open decked boats quite small boats and hence the story goes that you had a thousand boats in Wick Harbour and you could walk across the, the whole thing and uh, over a certain period of a three day fishing period that thousand boats came back with nearly 50 million fish into the harbour to be processed. So it was a very bustling place indeed. And in 1824 the harbour was extended and that extension was undertaken by the famous James Bremner of Keys, the harbour builder, the ship builder and ship raiser. 
Uh, and in four years, he'd spent £20,000 making the South Quay and uh, included a £5,000 cost to repair it after a storm washed it out uh, one stormy night. The Herring Mart was designed and built in 1892 to provide shelter and office space to local fish salesmen. It consisted of six offices, five of which were to be offered for let by public route, with the sixth being reserved to operate as a telegraph office. The first tenants were auctioneers David Sanderson and James Edward Harper. As the demand for office space increased, extensions were added at both ends to form a U-shaped building. However, with the passing of the herring shoals, these extensions were no longer needed and were removed, leaving the building as originally designed. In the herring fishing Hades, samples of the catch were brought from the boats to the fish salesmen, and the catches were then auctioned in the veranda area in front of the mart. Superseded by changes in fishing practice, the mart's future was uncertain. But members of the Wick Society spent many, many hours carefully restoring this historic landmark, ensuring that it continues to play a key role in Wick's story. Today, it's a community venue where Wick Society films, Johnson photographs and nautical artworks are on display. During the summer of 2020, when the museum was closed due to the coronavirus pandemic, the veranda area provided shelter for an outdoor book stall. This allowed folk to meet and engage with society volunteers. The perfect opportunity to share stories and memories, keeping alive that all-important link with the heritage of Wick, even in the most trying of circumstances. Due to the success of the herring fishing in Pulteney Town, a new harbour was required and the contract was awarded to James Bremner in 1828. The obelisk in memory of James Bremner was erected at the south head overlooking Wick Bay. Bremner is credited with salvaging 236 ships, including the SS Great Britain. His harbour wall technique of placing slate slabs vertically to allow the wave force to dissipate can be seen in many harbours around Caithness including Keith, Castle Hill and Sandside. James Bremner died at the Roundhouse in 1856. The RNLI lifeboat shed at Wick was built in 1915 and for many years served as the launch site for the Wick lifeboat. That changed with the advent of more modern lifeboats which nowadays are berthed afloat in the harbour. No longer in use, in 1997, the lifeboat shed passed to the stewardship of the Wick Society. That very same year, the Society took ownership of its fifey, the Isabella Fortuna. It was an ideal partnership. The Isabella could be housed in the shed, allowing the extensive restoration work this old lady of the sea required. This work would continue through the following two years, sheltered from whatever Caithness weather threw at it. Now, this veteran of the herring fishing days spends her winter sheltered from the gale, allowing the dedicated crew of the Wick Society's boat section to continue to lavish the care and maintenance required to ensure she is as seaworthy as the day she was built all these years ago in 1890. And the lifeboat shed still echoes to the sound of the boat maintenance for which it was designed. The effort and attention to detail of the boat section was nationally recognised in 2019 when the Isabella Fortuna won the prestigious award of National Historic Ships Regional Flagship of the Year. A just reflection of the dedication and commitment of this group of volunteers, past and present, who have given countless hours of their time and expertise to ensure the continued upkeep of this wonderful vessel. Pride of Wick's fleet can only be its magnificent fifey. But as if that wasn't enough of an undertaking, the Wick Society's boat section has in its care a number of other traditional boats, 
maintained and used with that same characteristic dedication, ensuring Wick's links with its maritime past are kept alive. These include several traditional yoles, among them the unique elliptical sterned diligent, a product of the now abandoned Isle of Stroma. It is one of the meanest of man's towns, and situated certainly on the boldest of God's bees. Robert Lewis Balfour Stevenson certainly wasn't in Wick for pleasure. He was here as a trainee engineer with a family business. The Stevensons were, of course, a renowned firm of lighthouse engineers and harbour builders. They had a major project underway to build a breakwater in Wick Bay, and that's what brought 17-year-old Robert Lewis Stevenson to Wick in the autumn of 1868, tagging along with his father, Thomas Stevenson, on a sort of mini-tour of harbour improvements as part of his professional education. But of course, Stevenson had no interest whatsoever in being an engineer. He was young, he had a creative mind, he was idealistic, and he wanted to write. So you could say that he was being dragged around these far-flung parts of Scotland under sufferance. Wick at this time was the herring capital of Europe. Stevenson himself wrote that it lives for herring. He spent just six weeks here, but it was an eventful time and it gave him a whole range of experiences. For a start, the weather was absolutely dreadful. He stood and watched a ship being driven onto rocks in Wick Bay in heavy seas. He mingled with fishing crews and other herring workers on the streets and quays of Town. He walked out to ruined castles along the coast here. He plunged into Wick Bay in a diving suit. He was charmed by a nice girl from a well-to-do family. He hung out with a bunch of hard-drinking cave dwellers and sat mesmerised as they regaled him with their stories. So there was plenty going on to fire the imagination. To everything he was exposed to in Wick and the surrounding area. Sights, sounds, smells, stormy weather, characters he met. I think it all played a part in his development as a, as a storyteller and author. And the Wick men stay indoors or wrangle on the quays with dissatisfied fish curers, Neheim brine, mud and herring refuse. Stevenson had been here for about three weeks when there was a major drama in Wick Bay and he was able to watch the whole thing unfold. It was a Sunday morning in September and uh, there was a storm raging. Uh, a schooner called Sophia was struggling towards Wick with a, a cargo of wood from Norway and the captain was beginning to think he wouldn't make it so he thought he'd try to shelter alongside uh, the breakwater or what there was of it but um, his anchors broke away and the ship was driven onto the rocks. Stevenson wrote and told his mother how his landlady woke him up to tell him what was going on. This morning I was awakened by Mrs Sutherland at the door. There's a ship ashore at Shelter Go. As my senses slowly flooded, I heard the whistling and the roaring of wind and the lashing of gust-blown and uncertain floors of rain. I got up, dressed and went out. The mizzled sky and rain blinded you. Eventually, the Sophia was uh, brought into port. Crew were all okay, but the breakwater suffered a lot of damage. Uh, some of the stonework was washed away, so there was much consternation. And Stevenson was clearly struck by the power of the sea and what it could do. Some of the waves were 20 feet high. The spray rose 80 feet at the new pier. Some wood has come ashore and the roadway seems carried away. I stood a long while on the cope, watching the sea below me. I hear its dull, monotonous roar at this moment, below the shrieking of the wind. Around 1850, Captain Eden was appointed as harbour master by the British Fisheries Society and he occupied the newly built Pulteney House. However, although efficient in carrying out his duties in improving the harbour, he was not the most diplomatic, particularly in respect of the Pulteney Town Improvements Commission. Hence, his resignation was sought and a Captain Tudor was duly appointed as harbour master in 1854. From 1898 to 1901, Major James Honeyman Henderson was the proprietor of Pulteney House, Garden and Coach House, with T.S. Mitchell, Collector of Customs, as the tenant. But the occupier of the Coach House and Garden was Robert Smith Weir's Leith, the solicitor. 
1913, ownership of the house, garden, coach house and stable passed to Alexander Flett, fish curer. Ownership continued until 1921 when brothers James and George Flett, fishermen from Fenechty, bought Pulteney House. Although the surname was the same, they were not related to Alexander Flett, the fish curer. According to descendant John Flett, James and his family occupied one floor of Pulteney House, while George and his family occupied the other. One weekend, the two fishermen transported their furniture on their fishing boat from Finnechty to Wick. The following weekend, they transported the entire family by sea. Ownership continued in the family until 1964, and in 1965, ownership of Pulteney House passed to Caithness County Council. Pulteney House is now a care home for 18 residents and was officially reopened on Friday 1st February 2008 following a major refurbishment. The pilot house is a small iconic building which overlooks Wick Harbour and the bay. Built in 1908, this lovely little building overlooking the harbour was donated by Sir Arthur Bignold to the pilots based at the then Wick's busy harbour as well as being used to store the piloting equipment. It was a prominent place for locals to watch goings on at the harbour and for fishermen to share news and generally have a good blather outside. There are seats attached to the four outer walls to give shelter whatever weather prevailed. From the pilot house one can get a panoramic view of the town and the harbour. It was closed in 1953 and was abandoned when local historian Ian Sutherland decided that it needed to be preserved, so he acquired the building and began to repair and restore it. While the pilot house can accommodate no more than 10 people at one sitting, it has become a favourite with locals and tourists who relish the opportunity to sit inside a place which was an important part of the town's maritime history. Brayhead. Over the years from this elevated position, many youngsters have taken great delight in identifying boats entering or leaving Wick Harbour. From this vantage point, the changing fortunes of the harbour have been observed with the passage of time. Black Saturday. On the afternoon of Friday, 18th August, 1848, most of the Wick fleet set sail for the fishing grounds. All was calm, but by midnight, a deadly storm was approaching the fleet. Some boats ran for home, managing to successfully shelter from the storm. Unfortunately, others were not so lucky as the tide had fallen by the time they arrived in Wick Bay early on Saturday morning. As they attempted to navigate the harbour entrance, many boats were thrown onto the rocks and piers due to the ferocity of the storm combined with the low tide. The Black Saturday Memorial. The Isabella was going to be the leading boat with the lifeboat close behind us. When it struck two o'clock, the Isabella cruised really quite majestically, I think, out past the open mouth of the harbour and then into the bay. And everyone kind of formed this really slow, majestic, stately, almost like a stately dance. Everyone was moving round each other. The moment itself was a moment of reflection of what had gone before and what had happened on that fateful day. So it was really quite a poignant moment getting to take part in this this flotilla, this celebration of life, but also a reflection on all those things that had gone before and about those awful days, the really dark day in terms of the history of Wick. The flotilla slowly turned and headed back into the harbour. She's looking back over my shoulder when we'd reached the mouth of the harbour and seeing behind us the trail of boats and it's all going out, making their way around and then coming back in. It was quite a moving moment. The event became known as Black Saturday. Following this tragedy, an inquiry was held and this led to many safety changes taking place. Improvements included a deeper harbour, partly decked boats and the development of the River Harbour. 
It also led to the installation of a barometer in every Scottish port. The cellar gates. This is a row of seven metal art frameworks forming gates over the entrances of Wick Harbour Cellar. Based on the drawings of Wick school children, the gates were designed by artists Sue Jane Taylor and Liz O'Donnell and made by blacksmith Ian Sinclair. They were installed in 2006 and add greatly to the interest of one corner of the harbour. The subtle lighting, evident during the darker evenings, enhances the artistic designs. But the icing on the cake, the thing that we had worked for five or seven years on was trying to introduce a new industry to Wick and that was the offshore wind uh, operations and maintenance and that took a lot of effort by a lot of people. John Mackay, our current uh, Vice Chair, he was the first to talk to SSE down in Glasgow and heard about the Beatrice Wind Farm and that was way back in 2010. 2017 we signed the deal of the century for the harbour. We signed a deal that was going to take us through the next 50 years of operating out of Wick Harbour. And when I was signing that lease and document, it was dated 2074. And it's such a long, long, long way away. You realise the importance of such a new industry coming to Wick. So we're reborn again into doing something different where we're going to have vessels with lots of men on board continually going out to the Beatrice Wind Farm from here to maintain them, to operate them, to change the service and so forth. And that indeed will create about 150 jobs in the harbour area with the Beatrice uh, teams and all the indirect labour that will be involved in supporting it and then the induced uh, workers etc. So it's a massive, massive boost. It's a new industry, it's something that the kids in the schools right now can aspire to being part of, engineering, all the different trades. It's a full cross-section of requirements to operate the, the wind farm. But that we're not done there, we're hoping to attract more and more of the operators that are currently planning to develop further out in the Murray Firth. <laughs>